Welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic, a breakdown of the Tesla third quarter 2023 earnings call from earlier this month, held 90 minutes after the closing bell on the NASDAQ, on a day that saw Tesla start in the red and continue to drop to a 12.17 loss during the trading day. Analysts looking at the pre-release document poured over it before the call began, and the stock price gained back a little bit of ground before Musk turned on his microphone, and then it was all downhill from there again. For the rest of the week, it turns out, front to back, Tesla lost over $120 billion in market cap from its top on Tuesday to where it landed on Friday, October 20th at market close. As we do, we're going to go over the highlights of ramblings from the Mumble King and try to cut it down into something easier to listen to because he was especially incoherent at times on this call. We'll cut out the stammering, the pregnant pauses, and the verbal trip overs until we get to something that doesn't make you want to pry out your own eardrums with a chopstick. But if you're a masochist, feel free to listen to the entire thing on your own on the Tesla channel. Something interesting to note here is that three days after this was released, only 67,000 views versus the 2.45 million subscribers to the channel, so very few people bothered tuning in for this at all. The YouTube feed from the official Tesla channel was dead air for several minutes after the intro music ended, so we'll pick it up from where Musk is first heard talking about the new factories and room for improvement. Then he's right into the robo-taxi vaporware, talking autopilot and AI. Regarding autopilot and AI, our vehicles now driven over half a billion miles with full self-driving beta, and that number is growing rapidly. Half a billion miles on FSD beta. Keep in mind, none of that is on a closed course and not under monitored test conditions. Now, this is all done on public roads, using the general public as unknowing and largely unwilling guinea pigs. An autonomous system that by Tesla's own legal admission is never going to exceed level two autonomy. Yet people routinely record themselves doing things in their car that Musk himself has done in demonstration videos that can easily result in serious harm or death. We recently completed a 10,000 GPU cluster of H100s. We think probably bringing it into operation faster than anyone's ever brought that much compute per unit time into production, since training is the fundamental limiting factor on progress with full self-driving and vehicle autonomy. Musk says they recently completed a 10,000 unit cluster of H100s these off-the-shelf NVIDIA units that anybody can buy for 30k a pop. And he claims Tesla completed this task faster than anybody on the planet ever before. As we know, Musk has a habit of making these type of absolute claims. He makes a lot of them during this call. The biggest in the world, the fastest, the bestest. But all you should be hearing when Musk makes a claim like this is this nonsense babble from TED Talk 2022. At this point, I think I know more about manufacturing than anyone currently alive on Earth. Listen, when it comes to making such a claim, it doesn't impress anybody who still possesses critical thinking ability. In fact, it should automatically raise flags and doubt in that person. If someone walks into a room and feels the need to announce, I am the smartest person here, that statement should carry no weight at all. It's most likely bullshit, but even if it's true, it's braggadocious behavior from someone that you really should avoid. <laughs> Enough! You are all of you beneath me. I am a god, you dull creature. And I will not be bullied by that. Puny god. Such a claim only carries weight when it's made by someone else that you know and trust. If a friend of yours says, See that guy? He's one of the smartest people I've ever met. That carries far more weight than the same person in question announcing his superior intelligence to the room. And there's a really good reason why fewer third parties are making that claim on Musk's behalf. The claim is that training is the fundamental limiting factor on FSD and full autonomy. Now, that being said, as we have noted before on many occasions, while Musk pretends that Tesla is some sort of leader in the autonomous vehicle sector, the harsh reality is that they find themselves in a similar position with autonomy as they do with their vehicle initial quality surveys on JD Powers. They trail the pack, and not by a little. Tesla is consistently found at the bottom of the card for both IQS and autonomous software innovation. Time for some more FSD doublespeak. We're also seeing significant promise with FSD version 12. This is the end-to-end -end AI where it's photon count in, controls out, compressing reality into a very small set of outputs, which is actually kind of how humans work. The vast majority of human data input is optics from our eyes. And so we are, like the car, 
photons in, controls out, with neural nets in the middle. It's very interesting to think about that. Some deep thought there, Mr. Genius. What that means is that, best case scenario, if you can ever work out the bugs, FSD will only ever be able to mimic what humans do behind the wheel using only their eyes. But we don't just use our eyes when we're driving. We use our ears, which can alert us to screeching brakes or vehicles in a blind spot, or hearing things like rail crossings and emergency vehicle sirens. You know, the types of vehicle your cars are notorious for hitting while they're stationary. We use our sense of touch to alert us to things like road conditions. When it's rainy or icy, we can feel the slip in the tires. We can react to a gust of wind appropriately. And even going back to our vision, we have the ability to instantly judge depth perception, where cameras require processing of signal to take their best guess as to where an object is in space in relation to them. Tesla refers to this 3D processing as vector space. The radar Musk removed from the system, like the LiDAR he refused to use because that's what everyone else was using, is the best solution for judging distance to vehicles and other objects, especially in less than ideal conditions. And the ultrasonic suite was another layer of protection, increasing the ability of the car to sense its environment. Other autonomous driving developers know the importance of having that sensor array. But since Musk does not share that philosophy, we've got no faith in FSD advancing any further on pure vision, and would prefer to see this bug-laden software removed from the public sphere altogether. The NHTSA has been more than negligent for far too long in their duties to keep motorists safe from avoidable accidents at the hands of Tesla software. Uh, we will continue to invest significantly in AI development as this is really the massive game changer. I mean, success in this regard in the long term, I think, has the potential to make Tesla the most valuable company in the world by, by far. If you have fully autonomous cars at scale and fully autonomous humanoid robots that are truly useful, it's not clear what the limit is. Now it has to be said, we already know FSD is miles behind the leaders in vehicle autonomy, and we know that Musk's bot demonstration videos are suspect at best, most likely falsified when you look at it frame by frame. And even if the robot was doing what it's supposed to be doing while being recorded, it's still at a basic entry-level robotics project. None of these demonstrations are ever done live, and for this reason, Optimus is simply not a viable product, nor is it likely to be. So if you combine an industry-lagging buggy software product with a barely functional bipedal robot starter kit, how exactly does Musk plan on using these dubious products to make Tesla the most valuable company in the world by far? By the way, he's been singing that hollow tune about becoming the most valuable company in the world since at least 2017, with an entirely different array of fake promises. FSD is the carrot that Musk has led investors down the path with for over a decade, and Optimus is just an embodiment of that failure to deliver. Neither are in any way remarkable. If Musk happens to deliver on these promises, against the expectations of experts in areas Musk has dared to tread, he says it's not clear what the limit is. However, by Musk's own admission, if Tesla fails to deliver on FSD robotaxis, the value of Tesla should fall to zero. Regarding energy storage, we deployed four gigawatt hours of energy storage products in Q3. As this business grows, uh, the energy vision is becoming our highest margin business. Energy and service now contribute over half a billion dollars to quarterly profit. So Musk announces four gigawatt hours of battery storage in Q3, and this growth in the battery sector sounds impressive. Giving credit where credit is due, Panasonic, who operates the battery facility at Giga Nevada, should be the one taking a bow for that accomplishment. After all, Powerballs and Megapacks use Panasonic technology and manufactured cells to store their energy. At the end of the day, Tesla is a reseller of Panasonic cells, amongst others, and apparently Tesla is ripping off their battery customers even worse than their auto buyers, since, according to Musk, this is now the highest margin enterprise under the Tesla umbrella. Now, let's break down what's happening with Cybertruck. The Cybertruck, I know a lot of people are excited about the Cybertruck. I am too. I've driven the car. It's an amazing product. I, I do want to emphasize that there will be enormous challenges in reaching volume production with the Cybertruck and then in making the Cybertruck cash flow positive. This is simply normal. When you've got a product with a lot of new technology, any new vehicle, brand new vehicle program, but especially one that is as different and advanced as the Cybertruck, you will have problems proportionate to how many new things you're trying to solve at scale. 
So I just want to emphasize that while I think this is potentially our best product ever, and I think it is our best product ever, it is going to require immense work to reach volume production and be cash flow positive at a price that people can afford. Musk cites enormous challenges with this vehicle. First, getting the production line up and running. Second, getting the product to a point of profitability, i.e. cash flow positive. He calls this conundrum normal for a product with a lot of new technology. Except what new technology is he talking about exactly? And how does Musk figure this low-res vehicle is their best product ever? When Cybertruck was first unveiled in 2019, it was supposed to be a stainless steel exoskeleton with bulletproof glass. The glass demonstration didn't exactly go as planned. Oh my fucking god. And apparently neither has anything else with this vehicle, including the price. The 399 price tag that people put deposits down on in 2019 disappeared from the internet a couple years ago. As for the vehicle, the exoskeleton concept has been replaced with a unibody casting. So now it's a stainless skin over an everyday car frame, and the stainless has been giving Musk nothing but grief, as was totally predicted at the time of the original announcement. Discolorations between panels and a propensity to scratch easily are just two of the issues. We've all seen stainless steel cars before, and Musk should have learned these lessons about using stainless from John DeLorean. Let's just say stainless is less than ideal for this purpose. Demo models on the road today show the vehicle to be poorly aligned, incapable of stepping over simple curbs, and easily getting bogged down in mud. In fact, the handful of hand-built Cybertrucks do not represent any new level of technology at all. Even the laser beam windshield cleaning system Musk patented has been replaced by a single ungodly 48-inch wiper that has to swipe the entire windscreen. But, according to Musk, the wiper isn't what will be on the production model, so they haven't even worked out that detail yet. In all honesty, the Cybertruck appears to have devolved into little more than a tinfoil kit car for a modified Model Y chassis. It's no more a functional work truck than this Fiero is a Ferrari. It's the same concept. You can buy a real EV truck, an F-150 Lightning, right now. In 2024, you'll be able to order an EV Hummer, the Dodge EV Ram, or the GMC EV Sierra. Real trucks sold by dealerships who have showrooms, service shops, and test drives. Or, you can buy a stainless suit of discolored armor to install atop a modified Model Y skate that has none of the functionality of a proper work truck, nor aesthetics of a desirable interior. Those other trucks we mentioned, by the way, were all announced after Musk prematurely announced the Cybertruck. To be fair, the formal announcement from Ford to develop electric vehicles came on May 19th of 2021, but two years prior, on July 23rd of 2019, Ford had already developed a prototype that was showcased in a video towing a million pounds of train cars across a rail yard. With the prototype, they already knew they were onto something. If Cybertruck had been ready to go immediately after the unveiling, Musk would have enjoyed a first-to-market advantage. But it wasn't, and Musk didn't, and now that advantage has been lost to Ford, who already knew how to build the most popular pickup truck in North America for the past 46 years. In fact, by the end of Q3 of 2023, Ford had already outsold their 2022 annual total on that vehicle, so they are not slowing down whatsoever. Now, because Cybertruck was not ready for mass production by the time they unveiled it, here's some other takeaways from Musk's wrap-up statement. Often, people do not understand what is truly hard. That is why I say prototypes are easy, production is hard. The difficulty of going from a prototype to volume production is like 10,000% harder to get to volume production than to make the prototype in the first place. And then it is even harder than that to reach positive cash flow. Although Musk had rambled on in the early days about how Cybertruck would be so easy to make due to his declared first principles manufacturing prowess, and he had sycophant channels like Sandy Monroe parroting this non-existent manufacturing advantage, it turns out that four years later, Musk still doesn't know how they're going to build these vehicles on the line the taped together handmade prototypes notwithstanding. Because Musk has no idea how to manufacture these vehicles at scale, he cannot possibly know how much it will cost to produce each unit. And yet, at the unveiling, Musk advertised the starting price of these units at $39.9, which is the price that people put their deposits toward, a minimum of $100 down. Musk mentions later that there are 1 million people with deposits on Cybertruck. Let's assume that's true, although actual numbers will likely vary and we know plenty of people put down deposits on multiple vehicles. 
At $100 per Cybertruck reservation, that means Musk has taken in $100 million for deposits on vehicles. He doesn't know if he can build at scale and what each unit will cost him, and he has reneged on the $39.9 advertised price from the unveiling. In other words, he has committed fraud to the tune of at least $100 million on Cybertruck alone. We're going to circle back to Cyberjunk because there's more that was revealed during this call. That is why there have not been new car startups that have been successful for 100 years, apart from Tesla. I just want to temper expectations for Cybertruck. It's a great product, but financially, it will take a year to 18 months before it is a significant positive of cash flow contributor. The demand is, is, off, is off the charts. We have over a million people who have reserved the car. So it's not, it's not a demand issue, but we have to make it. And we need to make it at a price that people can afford. Musk says this a lot. There haven't been new car startups that have been successful for the past 100 years. And we've gone through that BS before, showing that statement to be completely false. But let's say it was true. Tesla is not a new vehicle startup. Tesla was founded over two decades ago, so they can't play that card anymore. We're not talking a new car company. We're talking a new vehicle model. From someone who likes to tell people, At this point, I think I know more about manufacturing than anyone currently alive on Earth. On the surface is laughable horseshit. We <laughs> laugh. <laughs> Nothing but Musk playing his decade-old broken record of bullet points that are no longer remotely applicable. But below the surface, the scam that Musk has been pulling on people for years is slowly getting revealed. Uh, in conclusion, we continue to focus on ramping production while maintaining positive cash flow, and we continue to target around 1.8 million vehicle deliveries as stated earlier this year. Tesla is targeting a total vehicle count of 1.8 million vehicles across all models, which really is only two models with any volume. Hardly anybody is buying S or X anymore, so it's going to fall to 3 and Y. But demand for those cars has been slowing down, resulting in backlogs of inventory, and they can only be flogged off by making serious price concessions. So now, Tesla has been reduced to the types of margins typically found in the auto sector, meaning the days of pretending that Tesla is a tech company that also sells cars is over. Tesla is a car company, and it's losing market share. We've long thought of Tesla as a one-time first mover who squandered their advantage by failing to innovate while they had the lead. A lead given them by Martin Eberhardt and Mark Tarpenning, by the way, the original founders of the company. Another example of such a company would be BlackBerry, who had a stranglehold on the PDA market, thinking they were untouchable until Apple and Samsung came along and all but buried the Canadian tech giant. Muskrats, looking at Tesla's lead in the marketplace, think it will always be this way, because there's no Apple that's going to come along and steal Tesla's crown, although BYD in China is certainly taking Tesla to task. No, rather than one giant to come along and crush Tesla, it's more likely going to be a series of other factors, resulting in what the Chinese call Ling Chi, or death by a thousand cuts. If one giant could come along and take 100% of Tesla's business, it would still only have the same effect as 100 competitors consistently taking a 1% cut. In both cases, Tesla bleeds out. That is our prediction for Tesla's future, slowly bleeding out over time, focusing on all the wrong things, ignoring the fact that their automotive product line is either dated and stale, or an outright joke, as with Cybertruck. Not even additional false promises of a flying second-generation roadster using SpaceX cold gas thruster technology will have any impact. The Tesla AI team is, I think, one of the world's best, and I think it is actually by far the world's best when it comes to real-world AI. I'll say that again, Tesla has the best real-world AI team on Earth, period, and it's getting better. This is an opinion presented as fact, and there are people better established in respective industries who would take those claims to task. Most AI experts have zero faith in Musk or Tesla or Neuralink making any significant advantage in the realm of AI. Again, if some other third-party analyst would like to make that claim for Tesla, with supporting evidence to back it up, then maybe a claim like that would have some merit. Sure. And now let's go to investor questions. How many Cybertruck deliveries do you anticipate for 2024? It's difficult to make an accurate guess at this point. Going back to what I said earlier, that the ramp is going to be extremely difficult. There's no way around that. If, if we just try to do some copycat vehicle design, of which there are literally 200 models that are slight variations on a theme in the combustion engine world, distinctions without a difference, then 
you know, it's really not that hard. But if you want to do something radical and innovative and, and something really special like the Cybertruck, it is extremely difficult because there's nothing to copy. You have to invent not just the car, but the way to make the car. Now, I can say that if you say, well, where will things end up? I think we'll end up with roughly a quarter million Cybertrucks a year. I don't think we're going to reach that output rate next year. we we'll probably reach it sometime in 2025. That's my best guess. So after the babbling whining about how special Cybertruck is, and we're still not seeing it, the best guess that Musk can come up with is that by 2025, Tesla will be able to deliver 250,000 units per year. Of course, the number of reservations for this vehicle are all over the map, and most likely grossly exaggerated. Some outlets report up to 2 million reservations, but we'll stick with the 1 million reservations that Musk mentioned, a number first mentioned back in May of 2021 one quarter of the current reservation backlog. So 250,000 in 2025 and 6, another 250,000 in 26 and 7, and clearing off two date reservations by 2029, a full decade after taking deposits at the unveiling. Is there any other car company today that is taking deposits for vehicle that they maybe might hopefully be able to receive by 2033? If so, leave those details in the comments for comparison. Now it could be worse. They could have been forced to pay the entire sticker price up front in 2017 and then never heard anything about their vehicle again, including in this call. Some quick math for the people who paid the full deposit on the Roadster 2. If you had taken that quarter million dollars and sunk it into Tesla stock instead at $21 per share before the valuation lost all connection with reality, today that stock would be worth $2,523,810. If you sold all your stock two years ago at the all-time high, when Kimball and most of the Tesla board flogged their watts, it would have been worth $4,849,524. So people waiting on these vaporware cars have literally lost millions of dollars in the meantime. Same thing with the semi-trucks that companies put deposits down on at the same time. They've lost $10 to $20 for every dollar they put towards a reservation on rigs they ordered six years ago that were supposed to come with full fleet convoy autonomy. The convoy technology, the tracking technology, this is something that we are confident we can do today 10 times safer than a human driver. So this is, I want to be clear, this is something we can do now. Production begins 2019. So if you order now, get the car, the truck in two years. If competent legal teams ever arrange a class action, they should also be suing Tesla for this loss of opportunity on top of the undelivered vehicle. Can you provide a progress update on the 4680 cell, particularly progress towards performance improvements and cost savings outline on battery day? 4680 cell production in Texas increased 40% quarter over quarter. Congrats to the Texas team for producing their 20 million cell off of line one. Texas is now our primary 4680 facility. We're heavily focused on quality. Scrap is down 40% quarter over quarter, although we have a lot more work to do to achieve our steady state goals, and that is our priority. The Cybertruck cell with 10% higher energy than our Model Y cell started production on line two in Texas. This quarter, we convert to building 100% Cybertruck cells to simplify and focus the factory as we ramp all four lines in phase one over the next three quarters. Since the unveiling of the 4680, there's been a lot of hype surrounding this battery, which we always found odd. There's no real advancement here. It's the same type of advancement of a D cell over a C cell. It's a bigger battery, so it can hold more energy. And it says right in their own materials, the 4680 holds five times more energy, being 5.5 times larger than the 2170 cell it replaces. That being said, 4680 production is something that Panasonic has not been able to nail down yet as a battery supplier to Tesla. Putting those facts to one side, Tesla's own battery facility managed to produce their 20 millionth 4680 cell off a single line since inception in February. The Cybertruck is supposed to use these cells exclusively, each of them taking about 1,232 of them, according to Clean Technica. So 20 million cells divided by 1232 gives us 16,234 Cybertruck battery packs worth of cells, about 6.5% of the total number of 308 million cells just to meet Musk's quarter million vehicle delivery targets for Cybertruck by 2025, assuming that 100% of the cells coming off the line pass testing. And that's just for the Cybertruck. Model Y is also supposed to be taking 4680 cells, 828 of them at a time. The next question from institutional investor is, could you please provide an update on capacity expansion plans for companies, factories in Berlin and Austin, and the opening schedule of Gigafactory in Mexico? 
Berlin and Austin factory. The current priority is actually maximize the output from our existing lines by laser focusing on uh, efficiency improvement. In Mexico, we're, we're laying the groundwork to begin construction and doing all the long lead items. I think we want to just get a sense for what the global economy is like before we go full tilt on the Mexico factory. I'm worried about the high interest rate environment that we're in. I just can't emphasize this enough that for the vast majority of people buying a car is about the monthly payment. And as interest rates rise, the proportion of that monthly payment that is interest increases naturally. If, if interest rates remain high or if they go even higher, it's that much harder for people to buy the car. They simply cannot afford it. And, and we are tracking, I believe, at this point for Model Y to be the best selling car on earth, not just in revenue, but in unit volume. If you compare that to the other vehicles that are number two and number three and whatnot, they, they cost much less than our car. We're just hit, hitting law of large numbers situations here. So Giga Mexico is on an indefinite hold while Musk tries to get a better grasp on the global economic landscape which he whines on about at length during this call. This is only a small segment of the amount of time that Musk spent in total whining about the global economy. We've cut most of the rest of it out because his ramblings were frankly pathetic, and it did not go unnoticed that Musk spent the majority of this call monologuing in this regard without offering any solutions as the leader of the company as to how to navigate the current economic situation. Here's what we're going to say about this. If Musk truly has $26 billion in cash on hand at Tesla, then interest rates really aren't an issue where a new factory build is concerned. Even news reports from sycophant authors herald this cash reserve as their ability to function during times of global economic instability. But that's apparently not what Musk is going to do with it. Further, the whinging about how interest rates are interfering with car purchases is definitely at odds with results from Tesla competitors. BYD in China is doing great. Toyota enjoyed being more profitable than Tesla during the same time frame. And Ford, as mentioned, has already outsold their 2022 totals prior to the Q4 of 2023. They are obviously not being affected the same way as Tesla. But the bottom line here is Musk is sticking a pin in Giga Mexico until Musk is capable of being a little less paranoid about the global economy. But at this point, that might just be the Ketamine talking. Current sell side consensus assumes that Tesla will deliver 2.3 million vehicles in 2024, representing 28% growth versus 2023 guidance. Is this growth rate achievable without any mass market launches in 2024? And when does Tesla expect to return to its 50% long term CAGR? I mean, the risk of stating the obvious it is not possible to have a compound growth rate of 50% forever, or you will exceed the mass of the known universe. But I think we will grow very rapidly and much faster than any other car company on Earth by far. Here's Musk trying so hard to sound smart, but for once he's telling people the same thing that Tesla bears have been telling bulls for years. A 50% compound annual growth rate, CAGR, of output is not sustainable. That's what he's saying here. However, one of the things Musk is famous for saying to his legion of muskrats to draw them into investing is that by 2030, Tesla will be delivering 20 million cars per year and 1500 gigawatt hours of batteries annually. We went through similar math in debunking Solar Mega Project, how such a claim would require global lithium output to increase over tenfold compared to production over the past decade, just for Tesla products. To get to that 20 million vehicle goal by 2030, starting with the 2.3 million total delivery projection mentioned by this caller, Musk is looking at an aggressive rate of growth fairly close to the 50% CAGR being mentioned that Musk now states is unrealistic. 50% growth year over year would get you to 26 million by the end of 2029. A 37% annual compound growth rate would get to 20 million cars by 2030, but still, that is never going to happen and industry experts know it. So this past spring in April of 2023, Musk reiterated a goal mentioned the previous March in 2022, and before that going back to September of 2020, proposing a 50% vehicle output growth year over year. It's been one of his biggest sales pitches for luring in new share buyers. But now, after pumping this nonsense for at least three years, he finally acknowledges that a 50% CAGR is unrealistic which is what intelligent people said at the time Musk first suggested they could build 20 million EV cars per year by 2030. This effectively executes and buries that grossly exaggerated Tesla growth narrative. As for this statement at the end, 
I think we will grow very rapidly and much faster than any other car company on earth by far. Let's check in on the accomplishments of some of Tesla's competitors. Going back to BYD, Tesla's main competitor in China, BYD dominates the Chinese EV marketplace. Even NIO is on the rise, and they managed to perfect their battery swap technology. In May, NIO just announced their 20 millionth battery swap and 10 billion kilometers driven. On October 9th of this year, they announced their 30 millionth battery swap. Their process takes five minutes to receive a fully charged battery that is trickle charged, not supercharged, extending the life of the batteries. A five minute procedure instead of however long you're going to be waiting in these lineups. That's pretty impressive. Longtime followers of Tesla may remember Musk was awarded hundreds of millions of dollars in grants and credits to develop this type of battery swap technology for their vehicles between 2012 and 2015. But the tech they were paid to develop was never brought to market and was eventually forgotten about altogether. Just one more failed promise from years gone by. Do you have an approximate timeline in mind for the robotaxi, driven or non-driven? What excites you most about how this project is progressing? Well, the robotaxi is like necessarily non-driven. I, I guess I am, I am very excited about our progress with autonomy. The end-to-end, -end, nothing but nets, uh, self-driving software is amazing. Drives me all around Austin with no interventions. You know, it's clearly the, the right move. I know it's, it's really, really pretty amazing. And obviously that same software and approach will enable Optimus to learn how to do things simply by looking. Obviously, Musk went off the rails with his answer here. He never did answer the question. But this belief he shares that developing autonomous software for cars will somehow enable the Optimus robot to perform domestic tasks is a leap that very few experts are willing to make. Seems that if Musk was serious about developing autonomous vehicles, that would be the sole focus of the software engineers, without any concern for how a four-wheeled vehicle, essentially operating in a 2D space, would generate code for use in a bipedal mannequin operating mainly in three dimensions. But the next statement goes back into La La Land. You know, extremely exciting in the long term. And, you know, given that economic output is number of people times productivity, you no longer have a constraint on people. Effectively, you've got a humanoid robot that can do as much as you'd like. Your economy is quasi infinite, you know, infinite for all intents and purposes. And I don't think anyone's going to do it better than Tesla, not by a long shot. You also need to be able to design the humanoid robot in such a way that it can be mass manufactured. And then at some point, the robots will manufacture the robots. Musk has mentioned this before in previous interviews, that having robots take the menial jobs away from humans is somehow going to open the doors to an economic utopia, and that is just not realistic. The big brain doublespeak term that Musk uses here is quasi-infinite in a finite system. Quasi-infinite is one of those terms that Musk uses on a regular basis. He used it last year in pretty much the exact same context. In 2014, he was using it to describe the demand for battery storage. And in 2016, that was his term of choice describing the solar roof tiles he presented to investors to lure Tesla into buying Solar City. We know now that that entire roof tile presentation in 2016 was completely fraudulent. To top it off, quasi-infinite is an oxymoron, like military intelligence. Something is either infinite or it's not. Adding quasi, which means seemingly but not really, completely negates it then from being infinite. Why is he infinite? You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Assuming that Optimus is at all capable of doing the jobs and replacing humans, what is to happen to those humans? Where are they supposed to work now to make money to buy the goods and services provided by robots? Also, robots are already involved in workplaces, doing the heavy lifting, etc., and the most effective robots are custom designed to the task at hand. As a matter of fact, Musk tried to outfit the initial Model 3 assembly line entirely with robots, and that was an abject failure. Humans, he said at the time, are largely underrated. Human-looking robots, on the other hand, not so much. Long story short, having Optimus replace humans in the workplace is not only highly unlikely, even if successful, it would be a problem. Musk does the braggart thing again, and this time he also takes a shot at Boston Dynamics. And I don't think anyone's going to do it better than Tesla, not by a long shot. Boston Dynamics is impressive, but their robot lacks a brain, sort of like the Wizard of Oz or whatever. Here's the thing. 
Boston Dynamics robots do have a degree of artificial intelligence when navigating their environment, and the founder of BD, Mark Raber, who has been immersed in advanced robotics at Boston since 1992, has now founded the Boston Dynamics AI Institute in August of 2022, which is funded by parent company Hyundai. We put his knowledge of robotics and AI and any of the products that he's developed against the entire team at Tesla and their Optimus monstrosity any day, all day. Mercedes is accepting legal liability for when its level three autonomous driving system drive pilot is active. Is Tesla planning to accept legal liability for FSD? And if so, when? Well, there's a lot of people that assume we, we have legal liability, <laughs> judging by the lawsuits. We're certainly not being let that off the hook on that front, whether we like, would like to or, or wouldn't like to. Mercedes has a level three autonomous driving system called drive pilot. They announced they would willingly accept legal responsibility for accidents caused by the system while active. Musk attempts a joke about how the lawsuits are stacking up against Tesla from people who think Tesla should be held liable for accidents caused by their level two full self-driving program. This tells you everything you need to know about the level of responsibility taken by the respective companies toward their customers. It is night and day. Looking into DrivePilot, Mercedes has gone above and beyond in their technology and we got a good chuckle when we read this bit. DrivePilot combines information gathered from radar, cameras, and LiDAR, and, get this, uses microphones to listen for sirens and sensors to detect wet pavement. It also shows other drivers that an autonomous system is in use by showing blue lights around the exterior. And then Musk starts droning on about how special FSD AI is. Listen to the gibberish. Some people understand the profundity of the Tesla AI system, most very, but very, very few. It's, it's basically baby AGI. It has to understand reality in order to drive. Baby AGI. Baby AGI, he calls it. And again, no, it's bloody not. Nor is it going to be. This is a term he's heard around a water cooler somewhere, then stolen to regurgitate. Baby AGI refers to a concept where AI systems are designed to mimic the cognitive abilities of human infants or young children. This in no way whatsoever reflects what's going on with Musk's level two ADAS that he calls FSD. A human baby develops by using every available sense, especially the sense of touch. So if you actually expect your FSD to control a humanoid robot at some point, you'd better revisit the sensory deficiency in your originating system. Will Optimus be working on Gigafactory lines next year? If so, how many would you guess will be deployed? I'm not ready to discuss details of the Optimus program, but we will make provide periodic updates online. So after saying in a previous segment that the robots will be building robots, now Musk won't answer a simple question about what time frame should be expected here. Keep in mind, these questions are coming from investors in the company, who have obviously bought into the previous promises and are now looking for answers and timelines. Instead, they hear this. As you can see, where Optimus a year ago could barely walk, and now it can do yoga. A few years from now, it can probably do ballet. Ballet, hey? In a few years? That's cute. Now, just in case you ever in the future accidentally start thinking that Elon Musk is a genius again, remember these facts. Musk spent $44 billion and went deeply into debt so he could personally gut Twitter while at the same time having to hire engineers to cobble together an embarrassing bipedal demo robot. When for about 2% of that amount, he could have bought an established robotics company with existing products lock, stock, and barrel in 2020. That's what Hyundai paid for their 80% stake in Boston Dynamics three years ago. And that company will continue to make Optimus look like a fool's toy. Neural net path planning represents a significant advance in capability and safety for FSD. What steps is Tesla taking to make this technology available outside the US? So the question is, what steps are you taking towards getting FSD online outside the US? And listen to this long-winded response. The, the, like the more places we try to make it work, the harder the problem is. So the reason we don't do it in all countries simultaneously is that it would take much longer to, to make it work anywhere at all. That's why it's currently just uh, North America. And also for most parts of the world, you have to get approval before deploying things. Whereas in the US, uh, you can deploy things at risk or at least you can take liability for what you deploy. Whereas most countries require 
some sort of extensive appro approval program. We only want to go through that extensive approval program when we think it's kind of ready for prime time in that country. You caught that, right? The greater reason why FSD is not being deployed worldwide is because for most parts of the world, you have to get approval before deploying things. Whereas in the US, you can deploy things at risk or at least take liability for what you deploy. Whereas most countries require some sort of extensive approval program. That's the quote. FSD was let loose on North American streets because we're the only idiots that allowed that to happen without proper approvals in place. Jeez. Compare that to what Musk just said about accepting liability for FSD on public streets the way Mercedes is doing. Tesla is fighting every claim in court, but Musk just said he knows he's liable for what he unleashed on our unsuspecting public. If you're an attorney representing clients in any FSD action against Tesla, this statement is the silver stake that you need to drive through Musk's heart in court. Download it and archive it immediately. At this point, there's a long rambling question from a French reporter about the economics of autonomous vehicles. We'll spare you the question and just give you the answer that Musk provided, which is equally long-winded and rambling, but it shows Musk's disconnect from reality. The economics of a fully autonomous vehicle are, are truly astounding in a positive way. When you look at uh, passenger vehicles today, they, they only get about 10 to 12 hours of usage per week. If you, if you drive an hour and a half a day on average, that's roughly 10 hours a week out of 168 hours. And then there's also, you got parking and insurance, you got to take care of the car. It's like, there's a lot of, lot of overhead. The economics of the system are just uh, insanely positive, given that the car, like all of the cars we're making and have made for a while, if you're able to say, increase the utility of that car by a factor of five, which slowly means that you increase the value of that by five, but it still costs the same. So did you catch that recycled lie about how all Tesla cars are fully hardware equipped for full autonomy? Musk has been selling that line since at least 2016. It wasn't true then when the vehicles were equipped with radar and ultrasonics, and it isn't true now that they're down to pure vision. For this nonsense about increasing the utility of your vehicle by a factor of five, most of the statement is hog swallowed to begin with. You still have to have a parking spot for it. You still have to have insurance on the car. But if you're allowing that car to be used by strangers four-fifths of the time, that is no longer a personal vehicle. That's a commercial vehicle, requiring commercial licensing and insurance. Further, the car won't be available to you four-fifths of the time, and the vehicle is going to experience 400% more use, which means more battery cycles, more tire changes, more brake changes, more abuse of the interior. You're going to burn through your warranty mileage five times as fast and that will include the warranty on the battery, which is almost $20,000 to replace in a Model 3. Oh, and good luck getting a service appointment anytime soon if the car breaks down. You haven't increased the value of this vehicle by five. You've cut the life expectancy of this vehicle by 80% or more by whoring it out to the public, and your vehicle is probably not even going to be in your driveway when you need it. Finally, to state the obvious, if everybody fell for this statement, and bought a Tesla to use as a robo-taxi, who the hell is going to be left to use them? Rod Lash from Wolf Research. Can you give us maybe a sense of the rate of improvement that you see from the changes that you alluded to, the factory changes you alluded to? Is there a way maybe to convey the speed of improvement on your existing product from here? And then related to that, can you share the timing of your next gen, the, the lower priced uh, product that you talked about earlier this year? Uh, not at this time. Okay. And just as a follow-up, obviously price is also a driver of demand, but it, that's obviously not happening in a vacuum. And, and you, you mentioned that you're also maybe hitting the law of large numbers on some of your products. Can you just share how you're thinking about price elasticity just at this point and in this macro environment? I think that there's very significant price elasticity. I mean, to be totally frank, if our car costs the same as a RAV4, nobody would buy a RAV4. This barb out of nowhere at Toyota is a little ironic. See, towards the beginning of Tesla's history in 2010, Toyota actually teamed up with Tesla on a project that was supposed to produce an electrified version of the RAV4. The $50 million cash infusion provided by Toyota in the form of a stock purchase in the early days gave Tesla the liquidity it needed to get its feet under it and moving forward. It's how Tesla wormed their way into the California Numi factory in the beginning through their connection with Toyota, even though the RAV4 EV project eventually bombed. 
it seems Musk is no longer as appreciative as he once was to Toyota for keeping Tesla alive. Now, referring to this snipe, in the U.S. alone, Toyota sells between 30 and 40,000 RAV4 ICE SUVs every month fairly consistently with a base model MSRP of about 30,000 U.S. Car and driver gives the vehicle 8.5 stars out of 10. And if the Tesla Model 3, being the bare-bones stripped-out featureless interior that it offers, was the same price, despite Musk's claim to the contrary, it would not likely have a serious effect in RAV4 sales volume. At the 33 minute mark, Musk gets this question from Will Stein at Truist, starting off the monologue containing the most quoted phrase of this call. Here's the whole thing for full context. Let's now go to analyst questions. Uh, the first question comes from Will Stein from Truist. We learned earlier on the call, it, it sounds like you don't think the truck will ramp to significant volume until its third year of production. Should we have a similar anticipation for the ramp of the next gen platform? Or is there any reason that we should be maybe more optimistic or pessimistic about the uh, ramp profile there? To be clear, it's, it's not really the third year of production. It's kind of like technically there are three calendar years in there. But there's actually only 18, 18 months, not three years. I would be very disappointed if it took us, and that, that, would, that would be shocking if it took us three years. Mm -hmm. um, but 18 months from initial deliveries to reach volume and reach prosperity with an immense, I, I can't tell you how much the blood, sweat, and tears level required to achieve that is staggering. I've been through it many times. Yeah, I mean, Cybertruck is... Uh, yeah, I mean, we dug our own grave with Cyber Cybertruck, you know. <laughs> nobody, and you know, in general, I probably, you know, Nobody dig, digs or gray better than themselves. So Cybertruck is one of those special products that comes up only once in a long while. And special products that come along once in a long while are just incredibly difficult to bring to market, to reach volume, to, to be prosperous. It's the nature of the newness. That was the most quoted phrase for headlines immediately following the call. We dug our own grave with the Cybertruck. And we have to agree with him there. Even if the Cybertruck was being delivered to people for the price they put deposits down on, even if it was a steel exoskeleton instead of a unibody casting. There's nothing remarkable about this vehicle, which is destined to be a small volume niche vehicle driven only by Silicon Valley tech bros. Actual truck people looking for a practical vehicle are not interested. At this point of the call, Musk launches into a rant about people who work from home, which is something most office people and creatives are more than able to do if they have the right resources in place. This is not the first time that Musk has whined at length about people wanting to telecommute. Honestly, I would say it's like somewhat correlates with the why doesn't everyone work from home crowd. I mean, this is like some real Marie Antoinette vibes from people that say, why does everyone work from home? Like, what about all the people that have to come to the factory and, and fill the cars? What about all the people that have to go to, to the restaurant and make your food and deliver your food? It's like, what are you talking about? You, I mean, how detached from reality does the, the work-from-home crowd have to be while they take advantage of all those who do who cannot work from home? Like, why did I sleep in the factory so many times? Because it mattered. Did you hear the crybaby tears at the end? It sounds like Musk actually believes his own bullshit story about sleeping on the factory floor for three years to single-handedly fix all the problems on the vehicle production line. We completely annihilated that claim in our debunk Elon Musk TED Talk 2022 series. For those of you who missed this gem, it is one of our best bits, and we decided it's worth a replay because every bit is as relevant now as it was 15 months ago. Just watch all the nonsense that Musk was promoting during this time frame and see if you can catch any of the claims in here that never came true. Now we've already demonstrated what a load of crap this statement is using nothing more complicated than his Twitter log charting tweets over time. However, since he brought it up again, it seems like we might be able to delve a little bit further into this using the tweets themselves from this self-described three-year period of excruciating pain, living and sleeping on the factory floor so that his workers could see and smell him. We can also see from past news releases what his public appearance schedule looked like because he obviously was not in the office on those days either. The three years in question are 2017 to 2019, and these are just some of the highlights we picked up. January 29, 2017, Musk hosted the first Hyperloop competition. This happened again in August of the same year, July 2018 and July 2019. 
Across these four competitions, not one of the vehicles was running on air bearings, nor was able to carry even a single human down track. The same day, Musk was working with President Trump's advisory council on an immigration order amendment, because he's obviously an authority on immigrants, somehow. On March 24th, just after midnight, Musk was wondering where the f aliens are. May 16, 2017, this little gem about the Boring Company. On June 1st that year, after realizing he wasn't cut out for the job, Musk quit Trump's presidential council using the Paris Accord as his excuse. Considering Musk consistently whines about government regulations and red tape, he should have been all for exiting that agreement. On June 16th, Musk was hard at work coming up with his Mars Plan version 2 vaporware CGI presentation. On July 6th, Musk was in Australia promoting their utility-scale lithium-ion battery. July 15th, Musk appeared at the National Governors Association. Apparently, they declined to hold it on the Tesla factory floor, so Musk had to travel to Rhode Island for that. July 20th, Musk announces he's received verbal government approval, whatever that is, for the Boring Company, which has no Hyperloop technology whatsoever, to build an underground New York to Philadelphia to Baltimore to DC Hyperloop. This 330 kilometer long, 29 minute service line is expected to open for the general public to use in the June of 2000 and never. August 3rd, Musk was telling his followers SpaceX would be launching NASA astronauts to the ISS next year. Didn't happen in 2018, also didn't happen in 2019. But to be fair, Starliner did not hit that goal either. On August 11th, Musk was advocating for the regulation of AI, a product experts confirm he knows absolutely nothing about. On September 28th, Musk's new Mars plant is unveiled, ITS is replaced with BFR in the CGI videos, and that causes all of his fans to drool. On October 24th, tweeting how Tesla was helping re-electrify Puerto Rico following a double whammy of hurricanes Irma and Maria. The system depicted here was never used since it blew out the power circuits of the building when it was connected, and they wound up having to rely on diesel generators. October 28th, Musk was promoting the Boring Company's LA Tunnel. November 16th, Musk unveiled the Tesla Semi, which is still not in production five years later. November 29th, Musk announces a high-speed loop serving Chicago's O'Hare Airport from downtown. That never happened. December 11th, Musk was using Twitter to promote his boring company flamethrowers that were not a flamethrower. And a couple days before Christmas 2017, he was belittling people with PhDs, probably because he doesn't have one and wanted one for Christmas. Moving into 2018, on February 6th, Musk launched Martin Eberhardt's Roadster into space on Falcon Heavy. Of course, Musk personally attended that launch. In March of 2018, Musk gets a new compensation package that he authored himself, allowing him to siphon $55.8 billion in stock options over 10 years out of the company. He didn't actually tweet about that. April 1st, Musk sends out a tweet saying Tesla has gone completely and totally bankrupt. This is a prediction that continues to play out today. April 22nd was Musk's big robo-taxi pitch, declaring a million driverless vehicles would be on the road by next year. Two years later, that ETA remains unaltered. It is still being promised next year. April 27th, Musk used his account to woo Grimes with this tweet, telling her that comets are made mainly out of cocaine. And by May 7th, Musk had collected together enough comet dust to win Grimes over, debuting together at the Met Gala. On May 21st, Musk tweets a threat to withhold stock options from employees planning to unionize at Tesla. This tweet resulted in a three-year legal action against Musk and Tesla. Two days later, he's ranting about creating a website called Pravda to track core truth in media articles. Thankfully for him, he never followed up with this either, otherwise he'd be in real trouble. Just as an FYI, Pravda was the official publication of Soviet communists. On July 15th, it was the Thai cave rescue that Musk tried to make all about him. His concept for a rescue sub was rejected, and Musk took it personally. What followed was a series of tweets referring to a hero of the day as a pedophile. That was another legal issue for Musk. Then on August 7th, the infamous 420 tweet that cost Musk $40 million and the chair at Tesla. We heard from Grimes' girlfriend Azalea Banks that this tweet was sent out from his home while Musk was tripping on acid. August 15th, Nuke Mars. He clarified it was his intention to nuke Mars continuously to create artificial suns above Mars to somehow make it more livable. The next day, Musk gives an emotional interview to the New York Times admitting an ambient dependency, among other health concerns. On September 7th, that was Musk's famous pot-smoking interview with Joe Rogan, his first appearance of three on Rogan's podcast. September 29th, Musk settles with the SEC to avoid criminal fraud charges stemming from the 420 tweet. 
Less than a week later, Musk is goading the SEC by calling them the Short Seller Enrichment Commission after signing an agreement in good faith with them. On October 25th, send me your dankest memes. Apparently the Fremont factory had a meme shortage that day that was holding up the production line for him. November 26th, Axios on HBO interviews Musk where he tells them Tesla was bleeding money like crazy, the clip we used earlier about how Tesla would die without him. December 7th, the famous 60 Minutes interview took him away from a lining door panel so he could tell Leslie Stahl that he does not respect the SEC and that he handpicked Robin Denholm as his successor as chair at Tesla, even though she has no ability to stop him from doing what he wants. And on December 18th, Musk unveiled the Boring Company Tunnel, featuring none of the promised technology that was supposed to accompany it. January 9th, Musk tweets that the Roadster will use cold gas thrusters from SpaceX to make the vehicle fly, which is pretty much impossible. February 19th, interviewed by Kathy Wood for ARK Invest. On March 6th, Musk decided the best use of his time was to Photoshop his own face on pics of the rock. Good luck unburning those from your eyeballs. March 18th, he was interviewed by Jim Bridenstine for NASA. On April 2nd, Musk's first tweet about Doge happened at 2.24 in the morning, responding to a Dogecoin survey that wanted Musk to come on board as the CEO of the token. Little did they know what Musk had in store for them. April 12th, he was interviewed by Lex Friedman. Musk announced his Twitter is pretty much complete nonsense at this point, took time off the assembly line in Fremont to type that into his computer. June 13th, Musk is interviewed by Todd Howard at E3 Coliseum to discuss all of his favorite video games. On July 21st, he shared probably the only thing he remembers from college chemistry. Also, it's wrong. Pure alcohol is a solvent, not a solution. Earlier the same day, he was interviewed by CBS Sunday Morning. July 29th, Musk was pumping up a solar roof production wrap that never happened. August 29th, he was debating Jack Ma in Shanghai. On September 8th, he was pretending he's Sheldon Cooper from Fun With Flags. September 24th, obsessing about the metric system. September 29th, interviewed by CNN about taking people to orbit within a year, which didn't happen. October 1st, interviewed by Tim Dodd about Starship. November 5th, interviewed at Air Force Space Pitch Day. November 12th, accepting a Car Magazine Award in Germany. December 11th, fantasizing about life being a video game. The next day, fantasizing that we are nothing but brains and bats. And the day after that, his focus was in a galaxy far, far away, fawning over Baby Yoda. Yes, Musk had a very busy couple of years, but no, he did not spend every waking hour of every day on the production line as he repeatedly claims. Sleeping on floors? Maybe, but certainly not in the factory every night. These claims are all just plays of an emotional manipulator for sympathy for his imagined martyrdom. So Musk can save the teary-eyed reminiscing of the most painful period of his life in all future interviews. The story he tells is obviously bullshit. The tears are fake, and everyone has already heard these fictional stories before. There is nothing to be gained from hearing them again at any point in the future. And yet, here we are, at the end of 2023, still listening to Musk blubber on in interviews about how rough his life was. But getting back to the earnings call, we do have a couple more questions to get through. This one about cost-cutting measures has a very extended answer, but we're going to let it play through. George from Conacords. Just to focus on the cost per vehicle you know, coming down in future quarters, as you discussed, so I'm curious as to what the levers of that could be. Is it more scale, more factory utilization? Uh, is it material cost reductions? Is it things like giga casting? I mean, can you just kind of give us some data points to give us confidence that that's going to come down over time? On the cost question, I guess from the vehicle side, like, you know, as Drew mentioned earlier, we are always trying to engineer our products to be cheaper to make and more efficient to make. That comes obviously on the engineering side as we come up with new innovations, but as well on the supply chain side, on the logistics side, getting parts to the factory. It's not like a one thing that you, yeah, you have to statistics it's, statistics. You have to attack cost everywhere. It's like Game of Thrones, but, but pennies. <laughs> um, I mean, first approximation, if you've got a $40,000 car and roughly 10,000 items in that car, that means each thing on average costs four bucks. So in order to get the cost down, say, by 10%, you have to get 40 cents out of each part on average. It is a game of pennies. Even something as simple as like a, a sticker, <laughs> like there's too many stickers internally in the car that nobody ever sees. Something as simple as a QR code, you might think, well, putting a QR code on a on part, why not just put them, put them on there? It's like, well, who, are we actually going to use that QR code? And then inevitably, sometimes the QR code doesn't go on properly or you can't read it properly and then it stops the line. It does feel like digging a tunnel with a spoon at times. 
<laughs> Very much escaping prison. Yeah. Yeah, but there's, there's not like some accidentally, you know, some gold, brick of gold that we shot and left in the car, unfortunately. You know, we, we try to be very rigorous about improving the quality and capability of the car because any fool can reduce the cost of a car by making it worse and just deleting functionality and capability. And like, if you want to like lose weight and you say, well, I, would, I need to lose 15 pounds right away. Well, you, you could chop your arm off, but then you're sitting there with one arm and you're still fat. This is coming from a guy who killed the battery swap feature he promised after being paid hundreds of millions of dollars, removed radar from his self-driving interface, and actually disconnects radar systems that people paid for when they get the car serviced in the future, removed key driver features like turning signal stocks on the steering tree, and fails to even provide spare tires in his vehicles. The lack of self-awareness in that statement is astonishing. The last question that was asked revisited the pin being put in Giga Mexico and Musk took the opportunity to whine for six full minutes about the global economic situation and reliving Tesla's past financial issues. This extended monologue from Musk added nothing to the call, but it definitely contributed to a further drop in the stock price. So the moderator took this opportunity to cut the call short. All right, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thank you very much for all of your good questions and we'll see you again in three months. For those people wondering if we skipped over some announcements regarding other Tesla products they've heard about, here's a list of some notable omissions from the chat. There was a single mention of Dojo in passing as part of the AI spiel. There is a single mention of it in the pitch deck as well, only under forward-looking statements, and there's no word as to how it's coming along. The word solar, as in solar panels, as in what's left of Solar City, isn't mentioned a single time during the call, probably because they only installed 49 megawatts of third-party solar panels in Q3, which is down 48% year over year. The word Roadster, as in the second generation Roadster people paid full deposits for in 2017, not mentioned at all. In the pitch deck, it's only listed once on the chart as being under development. Recently, Tesla was pumping this revolutionary paradigm-shifting transport product called Semi. It was a big deal when it was announced at the same time as the Roadster 2, not mentioned once in this chat, mentioned only once in the pitch deck as being in pilot production. No updates on or mention of the groundbreaking revolutionary HVAC systems that people got so excited about back in April of 2020 either. Safe to say, that hype was all for nothing. And there's still no update on when Musk and Zuckerberg are going to climb into the octagon together. It couldn't possibly go any worse than the recent Logan Paul boxing match, so what's the holdup here? Get her done. Overall, reaction to this call is reflected in the after hours free fall in the stock price during the call, which continued for two days following. It remains to be seen this week if the bleeding will stop, or if Tesla is headed back below the 200 mark that it barely clung on to on Friday. If the 200 level gets breached, you may be looking at new 52 week lows, which would be fitting because even some of Tesla's biggest allies are realizing without Giga Mexico, without the growth they've been promised, with Cybertruck not coming to the rescue anytime soon, there's really no reason now for them to own this stock. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic. One final point about Cybertruck. While we were producing this episode, we unexpectedly received word that reservation holders have been informed what their delivery price on a vehicle will be, and they're not impressed. The tri-motor variant pricing comes in now at $98,990, a 40% bump from the offered price in 2019, and that does not include FSD or TTL. Looking forward to what we have coming up for you later this fall, we will be completing the Andrew Tate Matrix of Lies series, with the release date coming closer to the trial announcement date, and we'll be preparing a year in review episode to get caught up with other stories that we followed through 2023. We'd like to thank our supporters for their generous donations over the past few months as we had to deal with demonetized Andrew Tate content. If you would like to support us directly, this is the page to look for on Patreon.com. You can also support us by dropping a thumbs up on the episode, sharing it with your friends, and subscribing to the channel so that you'll know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns.